La 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 la. La 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 la. Hi. How are you? Hello, Paul. Hello. Oh my God, look who it is. Been a while. How you doing, Paul? The legend himself. Hi, can you hear me? I'm supposed to ask three questions, is that right? Look at you. Glasses, beard, long hair. <laughs> ah, oh my God. Hey. hey. <laughs> How are you? Oh, my people. Alex, we're on together. My God, man. Been a while. How you doing, Paul? It's going well. I got lots of questions. Do you have any questions for me today? Did they set you up with that? Yeah, I got a couple, actually. I think they're pretty good ones. So I can start with that if you'd like. Can I ask you one question first? What's it like playing Quiet Right? Do you love it? No, I do because it's the music that I was kind of brought up on. I, you know, I was born in the '70s and in the '80s. They were, you know, a big part of that kind of music. You know, that yeah. influenced Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses. And you know, when I started playing guitar, that stuff wasn't really in style. It was the '90s, and grunge was really popular. So for it to have a resurgence and me to be able to be a part of the second wave of it, second yeah. generation, is really, it was really cool. You know, because a lot, a lot of music, a lot of fads don't come back. This is now a nostalgia thing, so it's 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 an honor for me to care, be carrying it on. Actually, that's really cool. I I sent a song by a guy named Marshall of an old Paul Rogers tune, and I got a note back from Howard Lee. What an honor to see these young people having a resurgence with this older kind of English, you know, early free music, right? This early absolutely stuff, and um. I understand what you're saying. All right, hit me, hit me hard, Alex. If you've never asked me a tough question, well, this might change today. We'll see. So, all right, all right. it's it's a, it's a two parter. So, Back to the Future Two, Paul Reed Smith, in you know, in, throughout the movie, I want to know if that was clever product placement on your end, or if you have in fact invented a time machine and we just don't know it yet. Nobody's ever asked me that question. <laughs> It was unbelievably good product placement, and I was horrified. Really? I was horrified. Here is the ha the life of the has-been, and the has-been's choice of guitar was a PRS. I didn't want to be the has-been's guitar. I wanted to be the, the, the rock star's guitar. I wanted to be the cool guy's guitar. I wanted the guitar that, that sounded the best through the Marshall rig. I, I didn't want to be that and when i saw that they had placed it in that genre i'm in we had spent so much time placing the instrument in the movie that i mean if you if you go in another part of one of the movies uh it was hanging on the wall at the hard rock cafe when he's hitting mcfly on the head he's going mcfly <laughs> yeah. mcfly and yes. it was part of history i liked that I really liked that. I liked when they they the the one movie you had to get to get a to get out of jail. They needed a dragon, you know. Uh, oh, Airheads, Airheads, yeah, and Airheads. That was cool. I, that was product placement. Somebody actually took that guitar out of a dumpster and reglued it together and tried to sell it on eBay. Um, yeah. So what? The, <laughs> we did, it wasn't a real dragon guitar. They smashed. We took a picture of the inlay and glued it in between the frets so that when right. they were using the real one and then when they smash it they they didn't smash a real one i thought that was cool there was yeah, a lot I thought of it was the, real one <laughs> it was a lot of the stuff i thought was cool i was horrified now when orianti played the prs in the michael jackson movie i cried like a baby because she returned the favor that was unbelievable i adored what she did when michael's going teaching her how to play the solo and how to go after it and all that stuff so there's been it's been different for me yeah some of its product placement the one thing that was never product placement is when the photographer walked into guitar center rented that blue prs and used it as a dress for christine aguilera for the cover right. of rolling stone i have a picture the original picture on my wall in my studio without the Rolling Stone thing. And I was able to buy the guitar at one point from Guitar Center, I gave it back to her. I sent it back to her as a present. Because Very cool. the reason I gave it back to her is when James Brown died, 
They gave the nod to a woman to sing the tune, not a man. And she came up out of the stage singing It's a Man's World, and she absolutely drilled it. And I thought, if you're going to drill it, lady, you can have the guitar back. So Cool. So how was I with Back to the Future? I thought it was good product placement, and I didn't like the genre that it was put in. I didn't want to be the has-been bad guitar. Okay. All right. That answers the question. One of them. It's a tough question. I answered the truth. <laughs> Should I be Very shot good. for it? Should I be shot for answering that question on the internet? All right, go on next one. If you're gonna, all right, that's gonna be hard to top. That was good. All right, here's the other one. So I, I'm assuming you've seen it. Might get loud. All right, so I don't know exactly what you're talking about. So teach me. Uh, there's a there's a movie called It Might Get Loud. It's got Jimmy Page. And, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I know all about the movie Boyd. with the guitar in between them, and he's teaching them how to play a whole lot of love. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Now, though, if you were to make a sequel to that. What three guitar players would you put in that movie, if you could choose? I don't know, but let me talk about the, the Loud movie for a second. Mm -hmm. That guitar, Jimmy Page played a lot on, the, uh, on one of the solo tours. And he was better with that arm than almost anybody I ever heard in my life. And um, Outrider, is that the name of the tour? It, I think it was the Outrider tour. And I went to the show, and the sounds that Paige had coming out of that PRS were mind-boggling. And I got to hear him play In My Time of Dying on a Dan Electro and all this other stuff. And so I have a very good feeling about that guitar that was on the stand in that movie. I thought, because I saw him play it on the tour, and his rig sounded spectacular. It was a whole bunch of marshals with his logos on it. It sounded just like Led Zeppelin. I was like, oh, my God, are you that good? Yeah. <laughs> are you that good? If I, I mean, you know, look, if you put Derek Trucks and, and, and Carlos Santana and Warren Haynes in a room, which happened once, they talked a lot. The three of them talked a lot about the fact that you can't give other people chills unless you're, unless you're getting chills yourself and all the parties that Derek was too young to have gone to. And there were a lot of things that happened in that video that were spectacular. Um, I mean, I, I'd like to just see a video of Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, and um, Gary Moore. Um, he's not with us anymore going at it. I would like to hear um, people talk about what it was like in the early clubs in England. I would, yeah. like, I would like to hear the stories I mean, if, if we could get Guns N' Roses and Eddie back from the grave, I'd like to hear what happened at the Whiskey in those early days. Um, from what I understand, when Eddie was playing there, the whole town showed up, and it was literally like people were anxious for the first note. They couldn't believe he was going to walk on the stage, right? There were, uh, in, in Detroit, when uh, the Rockets were playing or Cactus was playing or some of these early... Um, American Led Zeppelin bands were playing. You know, there was a scene in Atlanta with Mother's Finest and and uh, some of these other bands. Um, I didn't get to go to the early Allman Brothers gigs. I, you know, I can just l list things over and over and over again that I missed. I was only 13 for Woodstock. My parents wouldn't let me go. I understand it was a. There was no food. There was no place to go to the bathroom. It was muddy. It was ugly. People were sunburned. Uh, but to be able to stand there at 9 in the morning when Hendrix played the Star Spangled Banner to a trash dump, that <laughs> would have been unbelievable. And they, they, they interviewed him later about it. He goes, well, did you ruin the Star Spangled Banner? And he said, oh, I don't know. I thought it was beautiful. You know, he was he was... He, his buddies were dying in Vietnam. I thought what he did was extraordinary. Yeah. So when you bring that moment up where he teaches whole lot of love to them in the movie, I, Dave, Greg Benedetto once sat me down and showed me how Paige played whole lot, whole lot of love because he'd done it in an interview. And I, I mean, here's a guitar. Let me, let me, I'll just show you what he, I, I was taught.
he stretched one note against another. Right. Sounds like a chorus pedal. It's not. It's him bending yeah. one against the other. I was like, are you kidding me? What the hell was that? You know, the guy's a genius. I mean, all stories about Earl of Led Zeppelin was that he had so many ideas while they were on tour, they just kept renting every studio they could get to record these tunes. I mean, you know, it changed music forever. I met him once. He asked me how I copied a neck shape. I told him how I did it. He goes, oh, that's what I thought. Good job. That was the end of the conversation. It was grounded, straight up, <laughs> simple. And he played a PRS most of that night. was on the Outlander tour. I, I thought it was outrageous what he did. There was another time, one last time, that Jeff Beck went out on uh, the guitar shop tour, and every single guitar player would go see him and start screaming on the phone the next day to all their friends. He played in New York, all the New York people call. He played in Texas, David Grissom and all the Texas people call. He played in Maryland, everybody called, you know. And I ran into Jennifer Batten and I asked her about it. She said, what he plays backstage is better on than what he plays on the stage. And I didn't understand it until I got to see him play backstage. Rhonda Smith let me meet him. And he played Broadway into blues, into Jeff Beck, into jazz rock, back into Jeff Beck, back into blues, back into Broadway, all in 45 seconds. And I wasn't astounded by what a good guitar player was. I was astounded by his encyclopedia of musical knowledge. It was extraordinary, Alex. So, do, do what I want a movie of Jeff Beck doing that? Would I want a movie of Carlos Santana practicing melodies in the back room? I've seen it. I've seen these people do things that just not of this world. I mean, the, Carlos knows how to play a, a melody to the person going into the bathroom in the back of 20,000 seats and, and the guy's humming the melody as he's going into the bathroom with his beer. I mean, give me a break. I mean, it's not, it's a rare skill. Is that the answer you wanted? Well, that's kind of the answer. It's just the question is, what would be, what would be the three guitar players? So you say you're saying Jeff Beck, Santana, and Derek Trucks. Uh, no, the one the video I saw was Warren Haynes, Derek Trucks. Oh, and right. Santana. Okay. What I want to see is Clapton, Beck, and Page talk. What I want to see is Gladys Knight, Paul Rogers, and Sam Cooke talk. I mean, right. I mean, how about Chuck Brown, James Brown, and Little Richard talk? <laughs> that nobody would, you would hear a pin. <laughs> I mean, you know, I've met some of these people, Alex, and you have too. They're brilliant. They're yeah. geniuses. They know how to control the air in the stadium. I've seen twice now Bruce Springsteen turn a stadium into a club. Literally everybody's experience in the audience was that they were in a stadium gig and all of a sudden, sunk, and it looked like you were in a club. I've seen him do it twice. How do you have that much spiritual power over an entire stadium? I, I I looked at my wife. I said, did you just see this? She said, oh, yeah. All of a sudden, we were sitting on the wooden stage. We weren't in the audience anymore. Are you that good? There's another guy in a band called Mana uh, Fair who's that good. Some of these people are geniuses. And supposedly, when Hendrix was on, he was able to take the whole, whole place and turn it into a spiritual experience. I'd like to hear them talk about that. I'd like to hear all of them talk about it. I don't know, Alex. It's a good <laughs> question. It's a good question. It's a very, very good question. Look, back to the future question was good, and that was good. Go for a third one. I didn't think you could beat it with the second question, but you did. So what's the a third, third one? one? Well, that it was kind of a two-parter. I don't know if I have a third one uh, off the right. top of my head. So you, I'll you, you kind of you, you actually okay. Go ahead. Tell me the one stage moment you saw that you couldn't deal with. Tell me the one thing you saw people do on stage. I don't care whether it was 
horrific, good, bad, but you just, your jaw was on the floor. Yeah, very easily. That thing where you take the guitar and flip it and it comes back around and you catch it. Yeah. That, that freaks me out. Cause I saw a guy do it once and the guitar went flying over the back of the stage and stuck on the ground out back. Cause could, you could have killed somebody. So whenever I see anyone do that, I kind of duck. <laughs> That's funny. The strap lock came out. Woo! The strap lock came off? The guitar went over the back of the stage. It was an outdoor show and stuck in the ground. <laughs> yeah. Dangerous. So that that's, you know, that, that's the one move. But no question about it. Unbelievable. <laughs> Did you ever see a piece of musical genius happen on a stage? Uh, well, it was probably, it's probably all relative, but when I was, my first, uh, my first big show was seeing Guns N' Roses play Foxborough Stadium when I was 15. And when, when Slash started the intro to Sweet Child of Mine, it was yeah. 65,000 people just, I mean, I know that's the power of the radio and it's, you know, I might've been experiencing it differently because I was a 15 year old kid, but that to me was, you know, life changing, you know, definitely re religious or spiritual, whatever. Uh, I definitely. saw Chris Cornell sing like a stone to a stadium and the whole stadium sang every word with him. And it was, I, I literally started to stand and walk in a circle looking around at every single person standing on their yeah. feet, singing every syllable of the entire tune to an audio slave uh, gig. And I never, I never saw anything like it in my life. I thought what he did yeah. was beautiful. It was powerful. It was beautiful. It was a real song, and everybody knew the melody and everybody knew the words. And uh, are you kidding if, me? Really? If you if you watch the Foo Fighters documentary, I think it's called Back and Forth. When they play uh, at Wembley Stadium, it's just Grohl and an acoustic out there, and he literally sings the first word, and the whole stadium just does the whole song. He just stands there and plays it, and it's chilling. He get goosebumps. If you listen to No Woman, No Cry very carefully, the audience is singing the tune long before he ever opens his mouth. You, but you got you to gotta, you gotta turn it up and listen to it. It's like the whole audience, the same kind of thing where he started, they, before he ever sang, they were singing the tune. Ah, Bob Marley, what a loss. Oh my God, what a loss. So Alex, what are you doing now? Are you touring? Uh, right? Yeah, we've been playing pretty much. We're on the road nonstop till November now. Every weekend, we're doing flyouts and we're doing a, a package tour called the Live to Rock Tour, which is us and Skid Row and Winger and uh, and Warrant. So it's like a package of all '80s bands, and it's been great. You know, who's playing drums and Winger? Is that the guy from the Dixie Dregs? Is he playing in that band? Uh, his name's Rod. I yeah, think Rod the Morgan. Guy. Yeah. yeah, yes, yep, he's the drummer. Rod's one of the best drummers alive. Yeah, he's really good. They're 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 musically they're definitely up there in winger you know they got the Beavis and Butthead thing kind of overshadowed it with the you know but uh their musicianship's top notch really really good wow it sounds like a fun tour yeah it is and it's like you know like we were saying earlier like the the second generation of people getting into this classic rock it's you definitely see it out in the audience you see a lot of kids you know parents bringing their kids and you know it's it's nice to see it still alive you know are you guys using in ears. Uh, I personally don't. Our, our singer and our drummer are on them, but I don't. I don't like them. Rudy and I don't use them. Rudy Sarzo. Yes, he said to say hello. By the way, I've met him before. Yeah, he, he said him. he actually he, he wanted to talk quantum physics with you. I liked him. He yeah, he's was, he's great. He was playing with Ozzy when I met him, and Ozzy walked into the room and he had the sweetest English lilt in his speaking voice and i realized why he's such i mean he had a beautiful voice not talking voice right right yeah I, it was really nice to me i really liked him he was a good guy well you give him my best give absolutely him my yeah absolute best that's interesting yeah he's great he's really he's really great he, he came back to the band last year and it's been uh it's been really inspiring playing with him. You know, he's got such a pedigree playing with Randy Rhodes and White Snake and the, you know, the original Quiet Riot. So it's, it's been very, uh, been very inspiring and very, uh, you know, a positive experience. Yeah. There's another bass player like him, Ricky Phillips, who I haven't seen in a long time. Do you know Ricky? Oh, he, he I do know Ricky. Yeah. He used, um, I, uh, I met him 
he's playing with sticks now, right? Yeah. Yep. He actually had a Bonnie Pink PRS bass at his house when I was there one time. At one point, yeah. So yep. he, he actually played with Paige and um, the singer from White Snake for a while. They had a band with a. Um, they had a band. I, 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 you know that that group of musicians that came out of. I, I was Rudy from L.A. Uh, he's originally from Florida. Is he from Florida? You know, well, he's Cuban originally, but yeah, he grew up in Florida. Yeah. Um, Fort Lauderdale area, I believe. Wow. Well, you give me my best. That's sweet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Alex, you asked me great questions. I you had <laughs> me you had me on the ropes with the with the with the, <laughs> the one from Back to the Future. You had me on yeah. the ropes. I never admitted to anybody how horrified I was when I saw that. I'm just wondering, I'm just glad I got the answer if you even knew, like if it was just a happy mistake or if it was done on purpose or whatever. Uh, you know? It was big time done on purpose. And they contacted us and wanted PRS guitars for the movie set. And, you know, we gave them the guitars and I just didn't know that's the way the movie was written. Well, you get, if you look at the bright side, they, that, that Back to the Future 2 takes place in 2015. Yeah. And if you look back, the only thing that really happened in 2015 that even existed was the Paul Reed Smith guitar, really. There's no hoverboards. There's no dehydrated pizza. There's none of that. So actually, on the flip side, you were able to make it to the future. If you think about it. You're right. But I didn't see it that way at the time. <laughs> I'm a glasses half full kind of guy, you know. Yeah, no, you're a good guy. <laughs> You've always been very... I don't think I've ever seen you perturbed. You've always been very even and straight and good natured and in good spirits. That's not the Paul I know. I wish I was that way. <laughs> Somebody went after me about my saltiness today. I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> All right, Alex, I owe you one. Thank you. This is going to be very entertaining for everybody. I really appreciate awesome. it. I appreciate it. And Paul, uh, well, seriously, thank you for everything over the past. It's been Love 25 you. years now. 25 years. It's been a long time. And you've been very, very generous with us. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Bye, Alex. Take it easy. Yep. Right, bye bye.